So I like to begin um, just about all of my lectures with uh, one of my favorite quotes from Theodosius Dubdansky, who is a, one of the fathers of population genetics, uh, who said, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And for me, this quote really um, underscores how evolution is not just a sub-discipline of biology, but really at the heart of how we understand everything in biology, um, how we understand the diversification of life forms and how they interact with their environment, which is of course so central to thinking about how species will adapt when it comes to things like climate change. So today, uh, I just want to introduce myself, provide a little background on who I am and how I got here. Um, very, very short little pre-quiz just to kind of get you thinking about um, about some of the concepts in evolutionary biology that are relevant for, uh, for climate change. And then we'll talk about different ways that species can respond to climate change. Um, we will talk about some common misconceptions about evolution as well. Uh, and you know, I, I think um, starting us off with that basis of a, a good shared understanding of what evolution is and isn't, is important not just for understanding adaptation to climate change, but also for understanding things like COVID. Uh, so hopefully that will be of um, that will be uh, interesting. And then we'll go through a few case studies um, from bunnies to whales and more, and uh, spend a, a, just a few minutes talking about evolution in the deep future, and then uh, time for Q and A. So I think as Michelle mentioned throughout it all. You should feel free to put questions in the chat, and we'll have a few, um, you know, a few spots here and there where um, you're welcome to um, unmute yourself and, and ask anything, any burning questions that you might have at the moment. All right. Okay, so um, just to introduce myself, I am um, a molecular ecologist and evolutionary biologist, which means that I use the tools of genetics and genomics to uh, explore questions both in evolutionary biology and ecology with a focus on marine organisms. So most of my research focuses on um, fishes and, and whales. And I'll talk a little bit about some of my own work at the, at the end of this talk. Um, and uh, I did my PhD here in um, Pacific Grove at Hopkins Marine Station and then moved to New York uh, for a postdoc at the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, spent the next 10 years or so in New York as a professor at City University of New York, but always with uh, the thought that I would love to move back to the area. So when I saw a job open up at CSUMB in evolutionary biology, I was absolutely thrilled. And I interviewed for that job on March 9th of 2020. Oh my God. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so I think I was the last, you know, I felt like Indiana Jones grabbing the hat as the door is slamming shut. Um, I, I flew out, interviewed for it. Uh, on the way there, nobody was wearing a mask on the plane. On the way back, everyone was wearing a mask. And I thought, well, we'll see how this goes. So they offered me the job. I took it. But uh, the first year was completely online. And so it's really just, I feel like I haven't actually been at CSUMB for, for all that long yet. Uh, but I'm really, really, really enjoying getting to know the community and wonderful students, faculty, and staff. Um, and so it's, it's a pleasure to, to um, be participating in this and get to know um, you know, the, the broader CSUMB community as well. So that's a little bit about me. And then, so what I'd like to do now, and I know this is going to seem very classroom-like, but hopefully you'll indulge me a bit, is to go through just a few little pre-quiz questions. This is to kind of get you thinking again about the mechanisms of evolution as they are going to apply to climate change. And I'll read them out. And I think um, typically in my classroom, I would have like a sort of a polling mechanism, but here uh, to keep it simple, we, if, if, you, um, if you want, you can put your, your proposed answer in the chat uh, or feel free to just scribble it down and we'll talk about each of them. So I'll give you a minute to think about this first one. There's only three of them. 
A volcano erupted on an island. The ash released from the volcano changed the acidity, pH, of the soil from the level it had been for hundreds of years. Which of the following is a likely outcome of this change? A, some species will disappear from the soil because they do not have individuals with traits that allow them to survive in more acidic soil. B, some species will generate the needed mutations to adapt to the change in pH. Other species will become extinct. C, most species gain additional genetically based traits and this increase in complexity allows them to live in the more acidic soil. And D, individuals in each species will evolve the traits necessary to survive under these new conditions. So some of these might sound a bit similar to you. Um, there, are, there are subtle but important differences between these answers. So the, the, the goal here is to choose the one that you think is the most likely outcome. Okay, thank you everyone uh, for your participation here. So we've got, it looks like about equal numbers between B and A with a few C's sprinkled in there. Um, as I said, there's some subtle differences here. So um, from an evolutionary biologist perspective, the correct, the, the best uh, answer here, the most likely outcome would be A. Um, so B is sort of a close second, but uh, the difference here is that B states some species will generate the needed mutations, um, suggesting that they are creating those mutations in order to adapt to the change in pH. Um, so a key kind of theme that we'll hit many times throughout this, uh, throughout our time together today is that mutations are completely random, right? They occur at random. Um, and so they are, they, they don't occur in response to a, uh, an environmental change. Um, so A, some species will disappear from the soil because they don't have the individuals with traits that allow them to survive. In this case is, um, is a better answer because it's not implying that, uh, that generation of the needed mutations. So mutations occur rather than being generated. All right, so second one, so second of three, uh, and this one will be <laughs> of interest to anyone that uses antimicrobial cleaners. Um, a chef sprays antimicrobial cleaner on her countertop. At first, the bacteria population, the bacterial population declines significantly. However, even though she continues to spray in the following weeks, the number of bacteria begins to increase again. Why did this happen? So A, some bacteria had traits that allowed them to survive the initial antimicrobial application. They produced offspring also carrying those traits. B, after the application of the antimicrobial spray, the bacteria needed to adapt by developing antimicrobial spray resistant traits. C, the antimicrobial compound caused a mutation for resistance to it. This trait increased in the population over time. D, the bacteria that tried hardest to become resistant left more offspring who were also resistant. So again, feel free to put what you think in the chat. So I'm seeing a lot of A's, which is correct, right? So here, once again, um, these other answers are suggesting that the mutation arises in response to that, um, to that uh, antimicrobial cleaner. Um, the, the, so that, that is not correct. What happens is that uh, mutations arise randomly or they're already present in the population and then uh, natural selection, in this case, the, the antimicrobial cleaner is acting on that variation. Great. OK, and last one. So we have here a, a given plant population is pollinated exclusively by a particular bee. A wet spring leads to a disease that wipes out all of the bees in the plant's habitat. What is the likely outcome for this plant population? A, a mutation will arise, which will allow the plants to be pollinated by other insects. B, because they need to change their pollinators, some plant individuals will adapt to be pollinated by other insects. C, this plant population will die off. D, enough variation exists within the plant population to allow it to adapt to any environmental challenge. Great, all right, you guys are on the ball here. Um, yes, C is correct. So uh, in this case, I mean, we would, we would hope that there is genetic variation within the plant population, uh, but it's unlikely that there would be enough variation to allow it to adapt to any environmental challenge, and particularly if um, it has co-evolved um, with a particular species of pollinator, um, then unfortunately the, the most likely outcome 
is that the plant population would, would go extinct in this case. All right, great job, everyone. So with that in place, let's turn to thinking about climate change and, um, and how we envision evolution occurring on our rapidly changing planet. So I don't need to tell any of you um, that mean global temperatures have risen 1% centigrade since pre-industrial times, at least as a result of human activities. Um, and in addition to increasing global temperatures, we see, of course, um, many other impacts of climate change, um, some of which are very, very painfully relevant locally, including um, forest fires, um, extreme weather events such as drought, hurricanes, rising sea levels. Um, so there's just about no part of the planet that's not affected in some way. And species, of course, are already being impacted by human-caused climate change and it's very rapid onset. And uh, that rapid onset, of course, limits the ability of many species to adapt to their environments. Um, there are, the IUCN um, keeps a running tab of uh, species that are um, on the threatened list that are affected by uh, climate change. And this is over 11,000 um, species. So climate change is clearly a threat, you know, an additional threat to these already threatened species uh, that increases the likelihood of extinction. So what are species to do? What are ways in which species might be able to um, respond to changing climates? So um, we know that there are uh, a variety of, um, of, of things that species are currently uh, we see species currently doing um, that uh, and ways in which they're being affected. So this includes ecological changes such as migration of salmon at different time points, uh, behavioral changes like early, earlier breeding times. We'll see some of these in, when we talk about case studies. Um, climate change is also causing significant physiological changes. For example, warmer temperatures during egg incubations are causing imbalanced female to male sex ratios in green sea turtles, um, with females accounting for more than 99% of newly hatched turtles on some nesting beaches. Uh, so, you know, when we think about the future of um, species under climate change, the future is, is now, really. We're, we're seeing um, all these changes happening now, and, and the, um, the questions are you know, how, how we're able to assess them and uh, the extent to which species are able to deal with climate change by moving, uh, if they're able to, by acclimating. Um, so acclimation, as we'll talk about in just a second, is, is a, a response that's um, plastic and non-heritable, so a short-term response. Um, evolving or adapting, so a herit more heritable, long-lasting uh, change, or, you know, most unfortunately, um, going extinct, of course. It's the last option. Um, so we won't talk a ton about movement, although I will bring it up again at the end when I talk about um, some of our own work on, on whales. Um, but we know that climate change is causing dramatic shifts in distribution and habitat availability across a really broad range of taxa and ecosystems, particularly those in high northern latitudes. So we see a, um, a general trend towards poleward expansion in many species, including uh, whole communities in some cases. So for example, arctic and tundra communities are being replaced by trees and dwarf shrubs. Uh, we also see a big decline in um, the number of cold tolerant species who um, can be outcompeted often by those that are um, uh, um, adapted to warm climates, and we'll see some examples of that as well. Um, sadly, we are seeing some species that are going extinct already. So um, this beautiful picture of baobabs in Madagascar just uh, show, it shows um, this magnificent ecosystem that is under huge threat from uh, climate change. Um, there's been kind of a, a, a sudden die-off of baobabs in Madagascar um, that, that researchers attribute to climate change. And then the inset picture here is of a uh, melomese. This is the Bramble K. melomese, um, the little uh, rodent that's unfortunately the first mammal reported to have gone extinct as a direct result of climate change. So it was previously found only on Bramble K in the Great Barrier Reef. 
and its habitat has been completely destroyed by um, rising sea levels. So it's presumed to, to, be, to be extinct. Uh, just a few words about acclimation, just to kind of contrast acclimation and adaptation. So two important concepts and important um, contrast. Um, so acclimation or acclimatization, you'll hear both, uh, refers to the physiological or behavioral changes within an organism within their lifetime uh, in response to a change in the environment. So um, species, of course, are adapted to a certain climate envelope in which they've evolved, but most exhibit some capacity to adjust to some um, variation in that uh, environmental envelope. Um, and this can be done through, for example, changes in gene expression during the individual's lifetime. Um, however, of course, there are limits to those physiological changes that can occur. Uh, what's interesting is that there is a, an intersection, of course, between uh, acclimation and adaptation where um, acclimation can itself evolve. So some species are much, um, much more, have a much wider capacity to adapt to different environmental conditions than others. Uh, when I was on the East Coast, I worked quite a bit on an Eastern um, killifish, so the Atlantic killifish or mummichog. So if any of you that grew up along the East Coast may know this little guy, uh, they're, they're, um, they're minnow-like uh, fish that live in estuaries, and they've just got this incredible capacity to tolerate a huge range of environmental conditions. So uh, one of the only fishes that I've ever known where you can take it from salt water, throw it into fresh water, it'll kind of blink and you know, look up at you and then and then start swimming around again. Um, so that's acclimation. Uh, but that wide envelope, that tolerance of a huge range of environmental conditions is, of course, uh, something that has evolved in the case of this this mummichog, right? Not not all fish are able to do that. Um, so that brings us then to thinking about evolution and adaptation. Um, the reason that we are here today and what we're here to talk about uh, now as we'll talk about extensively, evolution and adaptation, of course, have uh, has limits, right? But in this case, we're talking about heritable change that is long lasting, that occurs over many, many generations. Uh, but as we'll see, to evolve, you need genetic variation, right? So this is um, this is a a the, you know pretty much the only thing that you need to uh, evolve is genetic variation. If you have no genetic variation. Uh, then there's no capacity for change, right? Um, so where does that genetic variation come from? Um, and here I will ask folks to put stuff in the chat. Um, so any ideas about where genetic variation comes from? Great, so getting some awesome answers in the chat here. So mutations, right? So mutations are the ultimate source of genetic variation. And we saw that, um, as we talked about in the, uh, in the quiz, that mutations are random with respect to the environment. And uh, let's see what else we've got here. Uh, inherited trait, yep, so mutations are inherited. That genetic variation as part of the genome is inherited across generation. Hybrids, great, okay, good. That's terrific. All right, yeah, so when we think about, um, you know, where the genetic variation comes from that species now are going to be um, drawing from for climate change, uh, we've got mutation as the ultimate source, right? But um, mutation is very, very slow. And because it, mutations are occurring randomly, um, mutations are not generally a uh, sufficient source of genetic variation that species would need to respond to environmental changes in the short term. Um, instead, we can contrast uh, standing genetic variation. That is the variation that already exists within a population. So that's um, those are mutations that have accumulated over hundreds or thousands of generations, right? That are just present in the population. And of course, the larger the population in general, the more genetic variation we see in the population. Okay, so this is one reason why um, 
it's it's of concern when species when the number of individuals in a population declines quite a bit when we have a, a bottleneck a population bottleneck because that can reduce the standing genetic variation that's available to that population to respond to environmental change and then i saw hybrids in the chat too so another source of genetic variation um, is hybridization or in, sometimes called introgression um, that is when you have um, genetic variants or alleles that are moving between populations or even between species. And that could be natural or that could be human assisted. Um, and then finally, and most sort of <laughs> recently, <laughs> so all the rest of these are natural processes. And the last one is uh, genetic engineering, which, um, you know, again, the future is now. Uh, we are already seeing uh, technologies like CRISPR being used to engineer, for example, uh, climate resist resilient crops. Um, so that is um, that's not something that's you know a far off um, uh, kind of theoretical possibility. That is already occurring. Um, okay. So uh, this brings us to thinking about the time frame for how quickly species can adapt. And we're going to see many examples when we get to our case studies, but um, you know the the you know I think for many um, conservation biologists the the biggest concern um, with climate change is uh, how rapidly it's occurring relative to the time frame across which we um, typically understand that species can adapt. And so you know we we think of the time frame of evolution as being very very slow. Uh, however, we'll see that there are cases where if the genetic variation is present in the population and the selective pressure is quite strong, as it often is with climate change, uh, adaptation can occur over very short time scales, uh, time, you know, even several generations. Okay, so that brings us to um, thinking about what evolution is and isn't, so really clarifying for ourselves um, what, um, what are um, the mechanisms of evolution, the ways in which it occurs, and what are sort of some of the common misconceptions about evolution that we can, uh, we can dispel uh, as we think about how species are going to respond to climate change. And again, um, you know, this is much broader than climate change. I think um, for me, this uh, pandemic has really brought home how important a basic understanding of evolutionary biology biology is uh, for for our, our populace. Um, it, you know, we, we've never, we, evolu I tell my students evolution has never been so relevant. <laughs> and I wish it would, it would, it would get a little less relevant, maybe. <laughs> um, but, but at the moment, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's more important than ever to, to have um, an accurate understanding of evolutionary mechanisms, um, particularly as they apply to, to viruses. So um, what I would like to do now is just to take, um, let's see, maybe a minute to think about, you know, what you think are the most widespread misconceptions about evolution in our society, and choose a couple, and you can put them in the chat. And then we'll uh, we'll circle back. I'll give you the opportunity to to speak up if you like. Otherwise, I can just pick a couple and, and read them. So just take a minute. Yeah, we've got so we've got uh, general disbelief in evolution that humans or other species might be outside of evolution. In other words, we have certain species like humans that have, that don't evolve or have stopped evolving. Um, the idea of a missing link. Um, this is a great one. So evolution for increased complexity, right, is false. Um, dis uh, being descended from monkeys, of course, that's uh, classic. Um, and then uh, the tension between religion and, and evolution. Excellent. Thank you. This is wonderful. And this is just some highlights. I have um, I have a full lecture on evolutionary misconceptions that's an hour in and of itself. So I've just selected some of the um, the most salient ones, which which um, which many of you have already highlighted. Um, but the basic thing I want to get across is, you know, the evolutionary processes are straightforward, but unfortunately, we do have a lot of um, 
kind of overlap with popular terms and concepts that creates confusion as well as just a lot of, of misinformation in our culture. So um, to try to uh, clarify then, let's go through a couple of these most common misconceptions here. Um, so this one was highlighted by, um, by one of you in the chat. Um, the misconception that evolution results in progress and that organisms are always evolving to be better. So this idea that evolution equates to progress is something you see commonly in popular culture, right? And it's compounded repeatedly by, um, you know, science fiction, where you can often find stories where scientists find more evolved life forms or life that offers a window into our evolutionary future. And this misconception that evolution is the same thing as progress um, is an error that it really goes back to Darwin's contemporary, Herbert Spencer, who used the word evolution to support his metaphysical belief in universal progress. Uh, but Darwin purposely avoided the term evolution, actually. He preferred the term descent with modification. And that was exactly because of the risk of this uh, misunderstanding. So, you know, we know uh, that natural selection, in fact, is not um, producing organisms that are perfect, right? They, it screens for individuals that are good enough to survive and reproduce. And hence, evolutionary change is, is not always uh, necessary for um, species to, or I should say adaptive change is not necessary for species to persist. So many taxa, mosses, fungi, sharks, possums, crayfish, uh, horseshoe crabs, as you see here, um, have changed very little over millions of years. And uh, we know that many aspects of evolution are, are neutral rather than adaptive. And building off that, so um, many people think that natural selection is the same thing as evolution or that all evolution is driven by natural selection. Natural selection is in fact one mechanism of evolutionary change, right? So we define evolution at its most basic as a change in allele frequencies over generations. So um, that may result from natural selection, but there are other mechanisms that can cause the, that change in the frequency of alleles. Uh, or genetic variants between one generation and the next. Shown here is uh, my, a migration event between a population of um, brown beetles into a population of green beetles. Genetic drift, right, or the random removal of uh, genetic variants uh, just by chance uh, is another one. Uh, mutation will increase genetic variants um, and sexual selection is uh, another form of selection distinct from, um, from natural selection. Uh, this one appeared in the chat as well. This is a really, and this was sort of what, you know, one of the, one of the key points that your pre-quiz was trying to highlight, um, that natural selection has no intentions, right, or senses. It's, it can't predict what a species or an individual needs. It's simply acting on the genetic variation in a population, and that genetic variation is generated by random mutation. Um, that process of random mutation is unaffected by what organisms in the population, you know, like would, you know, what would be best for them in the future. Right? Um, so those mutations don't occur because they would be adaptive, they occur randomly. Uh, there may be mutations that occur randomly that are beneficial, and if so, then those um, will be selected by, um, by uh, selective processes. Uh, another misconception is this idea that evolution can only occur slowly and gradually. Um, it often does, um, and we see that in many cases, uh, for example, macroevolution of um, cetaceans, but it can also occur very rapidly. So we have many uh, examples of rapid evolution. Um, this, is, this is one from the fossil record showing how some species of uh, foraminiferans, which are a single-celled organism, evolved new body shapes in, in uh, kind of a, a blink of a geological eye. Um, and we, you know, similarly, we observe rapid evolution going on all the time. Um, so over the, even the past 50 years, we've observed squirrels evolving new breeding times in response to climate change. We um, we know that, uh, like for example, mummy chogs, that 
fish species I was mentioning earlier, they've evolved resistance to toxins dumped into um, estuaries and rivers that they live in. Uh, of course, we see microbial evolution and resistance to new drugs. Um, so there's a lot of factors that can foster rapid evolution. Um, it, short generation times, um, large population sizes, big shifts in environmental conditions. And we have a lot of evidence for it happening uh, rapidly many, many times. Uh, evolutionary change, as we know, is based on changes in the genetic makeup of populations over time, and it's populations rather than individuals that evolve. So uh, we know that evolution only works on heritable traits, right? So if a trait is has has no heritability, um, then it there uh, there is not a possibility that it's going to um, evolve over time. Any changes that are acquired during the lifetime of an individual uh, are not passed on to the offspring. Um, this is this is a class. You know, so some of you will be familiar with um, Lamarck, um, Henry Baptiste Lamarck, and his theories on evolution. Um, unfortunately, he had a he had a lot of really interesting ideas, and he's unfortunately for him uh, best known for this concept of individual organisms evolving during a single lifespan where he had this example of giraffes stretching their necks to reach tall trees uh, and that th that stretching during an individual's lifetime would be passed on to its offspring. Um, a, a side note on that is that of course uh, we now uh, know that there are, in fact, changes that can occur to the genome during an individual's lifetime that can be passed on in the form of epigenetic changes, uh, methylation patterns that, um, that can uh, be inherited. So that's sort of an interesting twist on, um, on our sort of fundamental notions about, um, about how acquired changes um, affect evolution. And you know, just kind of underscores that uh, everything in in biology, um, every rule in biology gets gets broken eventually. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, and this one came up in the chat too. This I, the idea that humans are not currently evolving. Um, so humans, of course, are as organisms. We are evolving. We're now able to modify our environments with technology, and we've invented medical treatments and agricultural practices and economic structures that that really have changed um, the challenges to reproduction and survival that uh, that our our ancestors faced. Um, so, for example, because we can now treat diabetes with insulin, the gene versions that contribute to juvenile diabetes are no longer strongly selected against in, at least in developed countries. Um, but, you know, we, we know of many, many um, examples of genetic um, of ev evolution within recent, um, you know, recent uh, human populations. So, adaptations that allow humans to thrive at high altitudes, um, the recent evolution of human genetic traits that protect against malaria, uh, evolution of lactose tolerance. So there's a lot of um, really interesting and, and uh, well-studied examples of evolution in humans that, are, um, that have occurred recently or are ongoing. Okay, and then finally, oh, sorry, almost finally, um, all traits of organisms are not necessarily adaptations, right? So many traits that, and this is this is you know the, uh, often phrased as sort of just so stories from Rudyard Kipling. Uh, when we look at an organism, it's very tempting to try to uh, parse out, you know, what is it for? Like, what is that trait for? Why does it look like that? And with the assumption being that there must be um, an evolutionary purpose, right? So many traits aren't adaptive at all, um, but are simply either relics of history, the result of chance, uh, or traits that are present might not be ideal, but still function somewhat. So here we have an example of the panda's uh, sesamoid bone, which um, is not a thumb, but essentially functions as a thumb, but not a very great one. <laughs> so pandas are able to use it to grasp, uh, grasp, grasp things, but um, not super effectively. But nevertheless, it still does, it still does function. Uh, so that's an example of a trait that is, is not ideal, but, uh, but works. And then um, here, finally, yes, we have uh, last, last one, this notion that organisms are perfectly adapted to their environment. 
And the key thing to remember here is that evolution only can work with what exists in the moment, right? These processes are never kind of able to think ahead. So we'll see lots of examples, but uh, um, you know, there's many cases in which evolution produces structures that are good enough, but not ideal. And this is often because there are trade-offs that are inescapable. Um, so one example is the parallel evolution of large brains and bipedalism in humans um, because of the co-evolution, you know, the, the fact that these two sets of traits are evolving in parallel in hominids, uh, bipedalism, and then larger skull sizes. Um, it results in a skull size that is not a good fit for the size of the pelvis when it comes to childbirth um, and causes uh, much more mortality in humans than in other, in other primates for that reason. So there are many, many um, cases where we can point to uh, constraints of evolution by physics or by um, uh, trade-offs in, in traits. Now we're going to dive into some case studies that are relevant to climate change, um, thinking about, again, where the genetic variation comes from that species would need in order to adapt to climate change. And this first case study is one of my absolute favorites. This is on bunnies, and it's great because you, know, you get to look at cute pictures of bunnies, but also think about this really interesting evolutionary mechanism that's driving fur coat color in snowshoe hares. So um, most, and I should say, this is work that was done um, in Jeff Good's lab at University of Montana by Matthew Jones, uh, who led the study. And um, Jeff is a terrific scientist and a wonderful human being and has, um, has really um, done a fantastic job with his lab, just kind of fleshing out this, uh, this case study from a variety of levels of biological organization. Um, so as you may know, um, most snowshoe hares change color over the course of the year from uh, brown in summer to white in winter, and then back to brown, as in this top row. So we call these winter white hares. Um, but in some parts of the US and Canada, and uh, mostly in the Pacific Northwest, some populations, they still molt, but um, rather than molting to white, they actually molt to brown again. So they, they produce another brown coat, so they stay the same color uh, in the winter. So they're still molting, but they're molting from brown coat to brown coat. So we call these winter brown hairs. And uh, this is pretty interesting because it's, you know, it shows this geographic pattern. So if we look at where snowshoe, um, the, the winter white snowshoe hairs are found versus those that are winter brown, we see this general pattern where the winter browns are found in warmer climates along the coast where we don't see um, heavy winter snowfall and the winter whites um, are in areas uh, where there's quite a lot of snow. And of course, this is, um, you know, this, this has to do with uh, the snowshoe hares needing to be camouflaged from predators. So we know that camouflage in nature uh, and coloration is under extremely strong selective pressure. Right? So a, um, a brown bunny on white snowy background is going to be, uh, it's going to be an easy target for predators, right? Um, so what's really cool about uh, the research in Jeff's lab is that they've been able to figure out the genetic basis of this polymorphism, this difference between the winter, what the genetic basis um, of having uh, being winter white or winter brown. Uh, to do this, they looked at the whole genome of snowshoe hares and they compared um, they compared hares that were winter white and winter brown across their range. And they looked at this measure of genetic differentiation between the winter white and winter brown called FST. So that's just a measure of how genetically different at any given position in the genome, uh, the winter white and winter brown are from one another. And so they see that across most of the genome, you see this pretty low level of differentiation. So the, the, the winter white and the winter brown hairs are pretty similar across most of the genome. But they saw this one place in chrom on chromosome four where the two, the two populations are very different from one another. And so when they looked deeper, they found that this region corresponds to a gene called agouti that is uh, one of the genes that's responsible for the winter coat color change. 
And they were able to do lab experiments on, on cells from these hairs as well, showing that the bunnies that stay white in the winter uh, have increased expression of agouti, this agouti gene in the, in the fall. Um, so they were able to not only observe this phenotype, this difference in appearance, but also tie it to a place in the genome where, uh, where it's occurring. And then they were able to, um, to actually find the genetic variant <laughs> that is determining the, um, the coat color and show that it's, um, in this case, actually a dominant allele, a dominant genetic variant that um, causes the winter white. So um, this is an example on the left of a genealogy or a pedigree um, in a mixed phenotype family. So we have um, a, in this case, it was a mother that they knew the genotype with a big A, little a, okay? So this is a heterozygote. Um, she has um, one copy of each genetic variant for the winter white and the winter brown. And, um, and then they didn't know the genotype of the dad, but they infer that the dad had at least one um, uh, small a here. And so these were the offspring that resulted. So uh, this offspring all the way on the right um, got the big A. And so the, the uh, resulted in a white coat in the winter, white molt. Um, and the other two offspring in this family um, uh, did not get that big A and so were, uh, were winter brown. So um, in this case, they've been able to take this, uh, this, their understanding all the way down to the single base pair level of what's driving this change. So then, you know, that, so that story is pretty cool, but what makes it to me even a neater um, example of uh, adaptation and the sources of genetic variation is they asked, where did this genetic variant come from? So they wanted to look at uh, both the, the, you know, the, the genetic variation within winter white and winter brown populations, but also of the closest relatives of snowshoe hares. And what they found when they looked at those genetic variants across the whole genome was that this genetic variant for uh, winter brown appears to have come from interbreeding with jackrabbits. So uh, black-tailed jackrabbits are closely related to snowshoe hares, and uh, occasionally there apparently has been some, uh, some interbreeding, some hybridization that has transmitted this uh, winter brown allele at some points. And in areas where there's very little snow, this winter brown allele is favored. So this is an example of a case where that genetic variant that was useful for changing conditions actually came from hybridization with another species. So as we think about climate change, then, um, you know, one of what we know that one of the areas of the earth that's changing the fastest is northern latitudes um, and Arctic and subarctic uh, circles. So we know snow cover is decreasing very quickly across the northern hemisphere. And um, we predict that this will have an effect on the distribution of alleles across the range of these snowshoe hares. So it's possible that um, because this allele for winter brown does exist in the snowshoe hare population, that they, uh, with enough migration from those coastal areas, they will be able to adapt. This might be a case in which assisted gene flow is uh, considered. In other words, uh, where humans um, would actually um, bring winter brown hares from coastal ranges into areas where uh, snow cover has declined tremendously. Um, of course, that, that is less preferable than natural movement for a variety of reasons. Um, there's always, anytime you're, you have assisted migration, there's risks that come along with that um, in terms of disease transmission, all kinds of other things. Um, but uh, that is a possibility in this case. Okay. So another uh, next case study is on uh, brown tawny owls. And this is sort of a similar case um, but one in which the genetic variation comes from a little bit of a different uh, source. So um, these guys are medium-sized tree nesting owls and they usually have gray or brown feathers. And um, that coloration, so this is work done um, by Carol et al. That coloration is shown, the sort of range in coloration is shown here. So it goes from gray to brown. 
And uh, historically, there were more gray owls than brown owls in, uh, in Finland, where this study was done. And this study was based on about 30 years of data. So one theme throughout all this is that the more, you know, in order to be able to track these evolutionary changes, you of course need very long data sets. And we, uh, we typically don't have those for a lot of species, um, which is why our case studies are, are still, you know, even though we know these changes are ongoing, they're still rather limited. Um, so this is, uh, we know that this difference in feather color is genetically uh, determined. So um, gray, gray morphs uh, and brown morphs, this sort of the, the two extremes here, um, have, have uh, there, there are known genes that influence the, the feather color. Um, and then we know the brown color variant is actually dominant in this case. Uh, interestingly, there are some other previous genetic studies that suggest that the brown owls might have some other disadvantages compared to their gray counterparts, including weaker immune systems and higher metabolic rates, meaning that they need to forage more in order to survive. Um, so that's sort of a backdrop to all of this. Uh, so we see that from these data that were collected over 30 years by uh, banding owls, that in fact, um, the brown morph has increased in frequency over those 30 years. Um, and at the same time, we see that snow depth, uh, snow cover has decreased. So um, these are the first two panels of this figure. And when I saw these, I thought, well, that's, that's a nice story and it, it makes sense, but how do we really know that this is, um, this is actually snow cover causing the, um, the decrease in snow cover causing the, the increase in the brown morph and not just a spurious correlation. And just to remind you, I like to remind my students what a spurious corre correlation looks like. Uh, there's a fantastic, <laughs> there's a fantastic website um, on spurious correlations uh, that in which you can pick different variables and see, you know, across across the last couple of decades, how different variables track each other. With the lesson being that if you are comparing, making enough comparisons, you will find some correlations, such as the number of people who drown by falling in a pool, compared with the number of films that Nicolas Cage appears in in any given year. <laughs> Look how well they track each other, right? Um, another one, since we're talking about climate change, this one's a classic. Is uh, decrease in pirates is negatively correlated with increase in global temperature. So clearly, if, uh, if you want to help stop climate change, just, you know, become a pirate. <laughs> so these are just examples of spurious correlations to, you know, that I always show my students to remind them that when you see two variables tracking each other, uh, you can't just sort of take it at face value that um, one is causing the other. So the nice thing is that for this study, um, these researchers did go the extra mile and, and they, um, they actually looked at how survival changed between the two morphs with snow depth. So they had enough data because they had banded so many birds that they were actually able to, um, to look at differences in survival with snow depth. And so uh, this is this lower left panel here. And what you can see is that um, the um, as, as the snow cover um, is, is less and less, uh, that brown morph does have a greater advantage. And in the case of these owls, I should have mentioned, you know, it's a little bit different from the snowshoe hares because these are predators rather than uh, prey. Um, but nevertheless, they still need to be camouflaged so that their prey doesn't see them, right? Um, so it's the, same, it's the same selective pressure just operating on the, the predator instead of the prey. All right. Okay, and then just another quick example on birds. And so many of these great uh, case studies are bird focused because um, people love to watch birds and collect data on them. And so a lot of our long-term data sets come from um, citizen science, like backyard bird count. Um, and uh, because birds are relatively easy to observe and to determine things like um, their survival over time uh, via banding. There, there's a lot of great long-term data sets on birds. Um, so this case study is on Darwin's finches, which hold a really special significance in evolutionary biology, of course. 
when Darwin visited the Galapagos in 1835, he collected the heck out of these benches um, and was fascinated by the diversity of forms that he saw. Um, they were really the, the kind of the central um, focal species, uh, group of species for him in thinking about natural selection and descent with modification. Uh, however, when he first collected them, they were so, you know, he, he observed they were so different from each other that he thought they were different families of birds. Uh, and it wasn't until he brought them, these specimens back to London and had an ornithologist, William Gould, uh, examine them closely, that the ornithologist let him know that, you know, based on various aspects of their morphology, the ornithologist believed them all to be finches. And in fact, it turns out that they, they certainly are. They, there's more, more than 18 species of finches in the Galapagos. Uh, they are highly, highly variable in um, the food they eat, in their beak shape, and they feed on all kinds of things as shown here from cactus flowers to um, the use of tool. They use tools to uh, extract insect larvae from branches. Some eat green leaves, some eat the blood of other birds. <laughs> um, some uh, eat ticks off of, off of uh, iguanas. So really incredible diversity. I'm sure that uh, any of you that have had the opportunity to visit the Galapagos have, have observed this. Um, DNA evidence shows us clearly now that all these birds are uh, descended from a common ancestor that arrived in the Galapagos around a million years ago, so not, not that long, um, and diversified from there. And they quickly evolve, evolved uh, into all these different looking morph morphs um, through a process of adaptation to different ecological niches on the islands. Um, this particular case study focuses on a species of finch found on a small island in the Galapagos called Daphne Major. And this island is really perfect for studying evolution because it's small, it has a small population of this species, um, the medium ground finch called Geospisa fortis. And uh, what you can see, so these are two specimens of Geospisa fortis, the medium ground finch. And you can see that these two specimens have um, a pretty different beak size with one with a more sort of narrow fine beak and one with a really robust thick beak. Uh, Peter and Rosemary Grant at Princeton University have been working for decades and decades and decades on this population of finches on Daphne Major, going back year after year to document every single bird on the island, every single uh, offspring, survival, uh, everything you can think, think of to, to study about each individual. So it's, it's probably one of the best studied uh, bird populations in the world. Uh, and what they've found is that the variation in beak size really affects what the birds can eat. Um, there are two main food sources on the island. There are these uh, small soft seeds called spurge seeds, and then there are harder, woodier, larger seeds called caltrop seeds. So the birds with the smaller beaks um, eat the spurge seeds very quickly, whereas those with the larger beaks uh, are better at eating those large woody seeds. Uh, and what the grants found over, um, over many uh, years of study um, was that the environmental conditions present on the island affect what seeds are available to the birds and create a very strong selective pressure, strong enough to create a difference in the mean beak depth over the course of just a generation. So in um, 1977, um, they observed a massive drought on Daphne Major that caused all those smaller little spurge seeds to dry up. And uh, only those larger caltrop seeds were, were left primarily. Um, so that, that resulted in um, a shift in the beak size to a much larger beak size for the survivors of that drought. Um, but they didn't stop there. So that's, you know, that's an example of evolution occurring extremely quickly. When they came back the next year and the year after that and the year after that, um, they continued measuring beak size and, um, and looking at how it uh, changed across environmental conditions. And they found that in some years, so after the drought was over, um, then those, those birds with the larger beaks were no longer favored, right? And then uh, the selective pressure uh, favored birds with smaller beaks who were able to eat the spurge seeds. So the message here is that you know, of course, natural selection um, is variable over time. Um, the environmental pressures that are acting on a population change. And so um, 
it depends on the variation that's present in the population, whether or not they're able to respond to those, uh, those selective pressures um, in the time frame across which the environmental change is occurring. All right, so just to, those, those are sort of the longer case studies, and then we have a couple examples of, of, um, of shorter ones here. Um, so pitcher plant mosquitoes are probably, I think these, this was sort of the very first original uh, case study that showed um, genetic adaptation of an animal to global warming. Uh, this again was a 30 year study from researchers at University of Oregon who discovered a critical difference in populations uh, of mosquitoes collected between 1972 and 1996. Um, they've showed that the, the more recent mosquitoes from 1996 emerged from their dormant period and developed earlier in the growing season in response to hotter weather. So that represented a change in the mosquitoes photo period, um, the, in other words, the day length that mosquitoes use as a cue to grow and reproduce. And that particular trait, photo period, turns out to be very highly heritable. So uh, the researchers were able to show that that was a genetic adaptation rather than um, an, an, you know, a, a, a physiologically plastic change or response. Um, so that was, you know, that's sort of notable as the very first uh, documented genetic adaptation of an animal to, to climate change. Uh, another one is the two-spot ladybug. So uh, again, this is, <laughs> you're getting a theme here, 30-year study. Um, this was um, researchers that looked at uh, ladybugs from 30 years ago in the Netherlands uh, on beaches versus inland in, uh, yeah, in, in the Netherlands. And uh, 30 years ago, if you were walking along the beach and you were looking for ladybugs, um, you would find that the ladybugs there would be red with black spots. But if you moved inland, you would find they were uh, black with red spots. So we have these two morphs. But in the past three decades, um, this research shows that there's more red bugs inland. So more of these non-melanic um, red bugs inland. And uh, they've done some physiological experiments showing that in fact, the, um, the red color keeps the ladybugs from, um, from overheating. And so they believe that uh, over the last 30 years, uh, this, that warming climate uh, in this area has resulted in uh, selective pressure that causes an increase in this non-melanic form. Uh, closer to home here, pink salmon populations along the uh, western coast of the U.S. Here, this is pink salmon in, in Alaska. Uh, we know have evolved to migrate earlier in the season uh, because fluctuations in water temperature can adversely affect um, fish population, leading to increased risk of disease and mortality. So if stream water starts warming faster than normal, um, it is... Um, selectively added advantageous for uh, salmon to leave freshwater earlier than usual. And in fact, now it's been shown that migration occurs nearly two weeks sooner than it did 40 years ago in, um, in this particular species. Um, so that um, the, you know, the, the, the bigger question with these changes, like we saw with the, the finches is if there is um, climate fluctuation across the short term, um, how much genetic variability has been reduced in the population if, um, if there's been uh, very strong adaptation towards um, a particular uh, climate regime. In other words, if, um, if, uh, you know, if we have these late migrating salmon populations that have completely replaced, um, or rather the, the early migrating salmon have replaced the late migrating salmon, that would reduce genetic variability in the population. It would make it difficult for salmon to cope should they have a temperature reversal. And then finally, uh, here's a little example from plants. So this is wild time in Europe where there's, there's sort of two axes to selection that are going on here. Um, but it, it began, uh, this, this study began with a researcher who noticed that this particular area where he would go to collect wild thyme, um, that the, um, all of a sudden uh, the thyme smelled different. <laughs> um, so he began studying this further and found that in fact, there's been an evolution in certain area. There's been a selection creating plants with more phenolic, so more essential oil. And 
the hypothesis is that that's both a repellent to protect against herbivores that become more common when it's warm, and that it, it also correlates with, um, with uh, those plants that are not uh, frost tolerant. So plant, plants that are not frost tolerant in this case actually produce more phenolics, so that correlates as well. Okay, and then finally, I just wanted to wrap up with an example from my own work here. Um, this is uh, this is a, focused a bit more on the, the on dispersal um, than adaptation per se, um, but it is a nice illustration of uh, how historical samples, um, especially from the deep past, can really help us think through and understand um, what. Uh, what the potential responses are of species in the in the present. So this um, this study was focused on trying to understand um, how gray whales have moved around ocean basins as uh, climate has changed from the Pleistocene to today and what might happen in the future. So this was published in Molecular Ecology a few years back. And I'll just walk you through um, what we did. So. As you know, the current distribution of gray whales is in the Pacific only. Uh, we have our population here in the Eastern Pacific that migrates from the lagoons of Baja, California up to um, feeding areas in the Beaufort and Chukchi Seas and Bering. And then there's a Western Pacific population as well um, with breeding and feeding grounds in South China Sea and um, Okhotsk. So we know based on uh, paleontological records uh, that gray whales were once found in the Atlantic. There's also uh, observations of gray whales from the 1700s. Um, so when we began this study, uh, the, the notion was that gray whales went extinct in the Atlantic sometime in the 1700s. Uh, so we were able to use ancient DNA to, um, to actually investigate how much movement between the Atlantic and Pacific there was. So we started out with the question of whether uh, Atlantic and Pacific whales might be two completely different species, um, or if they're, if they're populations of the same species, when, when, uh, when did they diverge and was there any migration between them? Um, so we, we had two sources of ancient material, um, we had a, uh, a set of material from uh, the Macaw Tribal Reservation. So I worked with uh, the Macaw uh, at a, a, an archeological excavation called Ozette um, that yielded a tremendous number of, of uh, gray whale bones. And then um, a, an even bigger treasure trove came from um, a fisherman actually. So. Uh, it turns out that trawlers in the North Sea often pull up whale bones. And um, most of the time we don't know what happens to those whale bones, but in, uh, in one case there was a fisherman who was so interested in this in whales that he just, every time he would find a whale bone, he would um, put it in his garage. <laughs> and so then eventually he decided to transfer them over to a researcher at the Max Planck, who then got in touch with me because I was working on gray whales. And so we collaborated to do this study. So our, this, is, this was our samples. We carbon, uh, radiocarbon dated all of them. And we found that they ranged in age from less than 250 years to greater than uh, 48,000. So really we're at that rate, at that point we're pushing the pushing the edge of what's possible with radiocarbon dates. Um, and we used ancient DNA methods to extract the DNA. Uh, we tried to use a single skeletal element where possible. So um, like the left ear bone, for example, shown here, uh, so that we would make sure to only get one individual per skeletal element. Um, and we used an ancient DNA facility uh, at the Max Planck Institute, as well as at Stanford. Um, so. Uh, this was a really fun foray into ancient DNA for me, uh, and we were able to show that, um, in fact, Atlantic and Pacific gray whales are part of the same species, and um, that they, they diverged uh, before the Pleistocene, uh, but there were several instances of migration, so not just one big pulse uh, over to the Atlantic, but rather 
uh, numerous pulses of migration between um, Pacific and Atlantic, uh, and always in that direction from Pacific to Atlantic. Uh, and those corresponded to times when uh, that were that were warmer throughout geological history in both the Holocene and the Pleistocene, um, where we think gray whales were able to cross uh, the Arctic Circle due to uh, less ice, um, less uh, surface sea ice. Uh, so showing that they really have this behavioral flexibility that they can use to expand their range during times of dif different climate. Um, and what's super interesting is that. Um, when we, when we think about, this is showing the past, current, and predicted habitats of gray whales. So when we think about how this is going to change in the future with future climate change, um, we see that you know, we're, we, our, our prediction is for, um, for a complete, uh, sadly, complete loss of Arctic sea ice um, in the next uh, several, in, well, yeah, by 2100, which is what our, our, our future uh, model projection looked at here. And this was at the time um, the, you know, the baseline um, IPCC projections. Uh, so we see an expanded, greatly expanded um, habitat for gray whales. Um, so some people said, well, um, does that mean that climate change is, is really good for gray whales? And, uh, you know, our response to that is, well, um, it, so there are, there are aspects of, of habitat that will be increased for gray whales, but of course we don't, no, you know, we have we have much less ability to predict what's going to happen to um, their current food supply, right? So the uh, the the benthic uh, invertebrates, the invertebrates on the on the seafloor that they feed on, um, that are are themselves dependent on an ecosystem that is uh, that has evolved under ice cover. So there's a lot of unknowns still here about how gray whales will respond. Uh, but what we can say from our study is that, um, so you may know there's been a few gray whale sightings in the Atlantic over the past uh, decade or so um, in the Mediterranean and, and off the coast of Namibia, first gray whale sighting ever in the, in the Southern Hemisphere. And um, our genetic work suggests that, uh, that you know, those instances might be sort of the first wave of an expansion of this species into, into new habitat as was found in the past. Okay, and then finally, uh, just with a few minutes we have, I wanted to just think um, a little bit about evolution in the deep future. Um, that is what Earth's biodiversity might look like in 100,000 years, in 1 million years, 10 million years, 100 million years. Uh, this was the original question that um, I was prompted with that uh, on a on a on a podcast recently, um, and it it really turns out to be a super interesting question to think about because we have, you know, what it makes us realize is how um, how much our future. Uh, depends on the choices that we're making right now. So the, the, the realm of, of possibilities for our future environment, that environment that will be shaping the species that persist in and have evolved in these um, next hundreds of thousands and millions of years, um, that environment uh, is being shaped by the decisions we're making right now. Um, and that's pretty sobering. Um, and we have, we have, uh, we have so, so little um, idea of all the directions that it could go. Uh, what we can say is that, you know, life will persist after humans are gone and, um, and you know, think about what that life might look like. And so that's the question that I was asked on a podcast. And I'll give you the, the example that, um, that I used. So in, um, you know, when I was asked this question and thought about it a little bit, uh, there's, there's lots of, lots of potential uh, directions in which evolution could go. Um, but one that occurred to me was um, the result of a, uh, a potential increase in oxygen that might occur if we continue pumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere um, and then humans um, go extinct because climate change, um, we'll end up with a very carbon rich atmosphere that could promote kind of a, a renaissance of, of, of photosynthesizers plants and, um, and microscopic algae uh, that, 
could enrich oxygen levels in the atmosphere. And um, this gets us to a, a case study from the Carboniferous period uh, some 100 million years ago, in which oxygen levels were um, at 35% or so, so up to 50% up to higher than they are today. And this resulted in uh, the evolution of um, insects much, much larger than we have now. So because insects are, they, their oxygen intake comes through their skin and not, um, not through lungs, um, their surface, surface area to volume ratio is constrained by the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere. And as you increase the oxygen in the atmosphere, insects are able to um, evolve to be larger and larger. And so the example that I gave in, in the podcast was of a, a, um, a praying mantis the size of a cocker spaniel. <laughs> uh, but this is not, it's not out of the realm of possibility. In the case of uh, the Carboniferous, we see these dragonflies, for example, the size of hawks. Right? So uh, another, another just um, example of how environmental parameters shape what's, uh, what's possible for the evolution of species. If we can um, kind of close with this thought, um, this is sort of what I want to end on, this notion that we can feel very powerless in the face of climate change. It can be really very depressing, honestly, for all of us that care about biodiversity. And I think for me, what I'd like to emphasize is that the best thing that we can do for species to give them a fighting chance to adapt to climate change is to protect their genetic diversity, and that means protecting their habitat. So it means protecting their population sizes, protecting migration corridors that allow them to share genetic diversity between populations, and preserving all the genetic diversity in these populations that we can, which again means preserving their habitat. So if we can do what we can to conserve these ecosystems intact, then that will give species a fighting chance to at least maintain the genetic variation that they can in the face of these great changes to come.